Thank you to the chairs and to the organising committee for allowing me to speak on this topic. Um, the inspiration for this talk came from the ICU annual scientific meeting earlier this year, at which point they discussed in a, a great amount of detail the impact of looking at the microbiome in critically ill patients. And I thought, well, surely if it applies to them, um, perhaps there is some data that applies to us. Compared to 18 years ago, when I was a first year medical student, we were told that people that got fat just ate too much. And fortunately, we are learning more and more that it is the interplay of a number of different areas, including physiological malabsorption, hormonal signaling, we've heard a bit about FXR today, bile acids as a ligand for that molecular target, and the gut microbiome, but uh, it's by no means an answer, and it's perhaps more of a question. I'm delighted to see that a, of a number of papers that I've referenced in the literature review, the authors are with us at the, the conference, um, including Professors Randy Seeley and Professor Carol LaRue, and any difficult questions, I'll refer to them. So I will go through a few definitions of a microbiome and the microbiota. The microbiota reflects the collective of the microorganisms within a specific anatomical environment. And uh, in this case, we're talking purely about the gut. The microbiome is the collective genome, all of the genes in the DNA that make it up of the microbiota, the bacteria, fungi, viruses, and the bacteriophages. Diversity is good, that much we know, but what happens without diversity? Uh, a state called dysbiosis, a shift in the microbial composition away from the so-called healthy state, um, and that leads to the pathobiome. There are a number of factors, and none of them have been defined as purely cause or purely effect, but these include diet, stresses, smoking, medications, in particular, antibiotics. So without further ado, the studies that I've looked at have been both animal and human, starting with looking at diet alone. Um, Turnbull looked at five Western diet rats, high fat, high sugar diet, versus those on the chow diet. So that's low fat and high polysaccharide. After 12 weeks of this diet, they were sacrificed and then their sequel microbiota was harvested and transplanted into a new set um, of rats on the, the converse diet. Of the rats that had Western uh, sequel microbiota transplanted, but they're on chow diet, um, you would have expected their weight gain to be much lower in the league of 24%. It was in fact 43%. And conversely, uh, we know that those that had um, the chow diet fed sequel microbiota transplanted into them had a much uh, lower uh, amount of weight gain, even though the, there was no difference in the level of consumption or initial weight between the recipients of the obese and lean sequel microbiotas. So this seemed to indicate that the obese gut microbiota has some level of transmissible capacity to promote fat deposition. What about with surgery? So one of the earlier studies by Lee and also uh, co-authored by Professor LaRue uh, was a, a rat model. And in their sham uh, model, they, they didn't just have no surgery. They indeed had a gastrotomy and a jejunostomy that was oversown. Uh, for the Ruin Y gastric bypass rodents, uh, they used a standardised 15 centimetre BP limb. DNA extraction was done from the faecal pellets, and this is possibly one of the most important slides of my presentation. They found an increase in proteobacteria of 52-fold, and that proteobacteria includes E. coli, Salmonella, Vibrio and Helicobacter. There was a lower number of firmicutes, 4.5-fold, and the firmicutes, of course, include um, uh, Clostridium and Bacilli, including Lactobacilli. There was also a two-fold increase in Bacteroides. These are the three groups that I've concentrated on the most because these mirrored uh, the, the human results, which I'll get to soon. Liao, in 2013, um, did a similar procedure and had very similar outcomes. What about the humans? Uh, the earliest study was done by Zhang in 2009. 
in terms of the numbers. All of these numbers are extremely small for subjects. However, they were studied in great detail. He took three normal weight uh, patients, three morbidly obese, and three post renal gastric bypass at zero, eight, and 15 month intervals. From that graph, if it projects, you can look at comparing the normal weight patients to the gastric bypass patients, the decrease in the overall numbers of clostridia abundance. Likewise, if you look at the proteobacteria, the gamma proteobacteria, the dark blue, that's increased significantly in the brew and white gastric bypass patients. Furet in 2010 took 13 lean controls and 30 obese subjects um, at preoperative three and six month intervals. Um, there was an increase in E. coli, and E. coli was one of our uh, gamma proteobacteria, decreased firmicutes, the uh, gram positives. In particular, and I put that up because it was interesting to me, the lactic acid bacteria, again reflecting the murine and rodent studies, had decreased. And I, I put that up because um, some practitioners are using Yakult and others as an adjunct in their, their therapy. So perhaps we're doing the wrong thing when we give that to them. And there was a decrease in bacteroides. 2013, uh, Dr. Grazler looked at six patients who underwent real wide gastric bypass. There were the ranges as presented there. Uh, the inside circle is the preoperative bacterial abundance. The outside circle is postoperative. And again, we have this mirroring in the changes for firmicutes, the bacteroides, and the proteobacteria. I found that relatively exciting. Finally, Professor LaRue in 2015. Again, it, um, this is possibly the longest data we have of 9.4 years of follow-up. We randomised 14 female patients to Rouenoy gastric bypass or vertical ba uh, gastric banding with seven in each. Um, uh, vertically banded gastroplasty, I apologise. And uh, again, he found there was much higher gamma proteobacteria species and lower firmicutes. Of note, there was no difference in the microbiota profiles between Rouenoy gastric bypass and the VBGs. So where does that leave us and what does that mean? Granted that the numbers of papers are extremely small. They're extremely small for humans um, and there's only a few more for murine and rodent models. So I must give credit to Professor Imad Omar who gave the talk at the ICU conference that was the inspiration for this. And uh, he's been looking at ways to make fecal microbial transplant more palatable. This is his term, not mine, the, the crapule. And uh, the, the idea behind a crapule is if you give- Two minutes. Um, thank you. A, uh, uh, a fecal sample that's suspended in saline from a normal, happy, healthy human, um, sieve it, centrifuge it, clean it up as much as you can, take away the odor, reseal it and freeze it and then give it to patients who have relapsing C. diff infections. At least symptomatically, they seem to show an overall rate of diarrhea resolution in patients who had intractable di diarrhea for months to years beforehand from proven relapsing C. diff infection. So that was where part of the idea came from, and perhaps crapules are the future. There are many limitations to the studies that I presented. Um, uh, they are largely animal models, the human trials are equally limited by extremely small numbers. Um, there is a lack of long-term investigations. The only long-term one is um, that by Professor LaRue. We know that bariatric surgery affects the prevalence of many microbial species, but other than the three groups I've talked about, we don't really have a good idea of what the, the good taxonomy is. It is the old chicken and egg argument. Correlation does not imply causation. We know there's an interplay of a number of different factors uh, between microbiome, hormonal signaling, and bile acids. <coughs> Whilst bile acids can change the microbiome, the microbiota can change bile acids. So I guess my conclusions are more questions than answers, but one thing we do know is that diversity is good. Well, at least we'll find out on the 15th of November. 
<laughs> um, animal studies do suggest that gut microbiome influences percentage excess weight loss, which is significant for us as uh, bariatric teams. Human studies do support the notion of obesity relating to taxonomic profiles, but it is a dynamic state of affairs, and clarification of these pathways may lead to more personalised therapeutic interventions in future. Thank you.